Of course, I grew up in a segregated city. Oklahoma City was totally divided. I went to an all segregated school, uh, both through uh, elementary, junior high, senior high school. It was all segregated. So it was a very, very small world for us, very limited with uh, uh, commerce. We had, we did have commerce, Second Street now, and Steep Deuce, and, and the schools and the churches were basically our overall uh, activities. And I don't know uh, if you would truly understand a true segregated community. It's, uh, it's not hard to define, it's just that you see the same people, the people of color, uh, you're confined to that area and uh, uh, very limited to what, what you could do. Now, you could come downtown, but I'll give you a good example. If you came, when I was a little kid, if you came downtown, I, I can recall this experience. Uh, we had Halliburton's here, and we came downtown. Uh, my mother brought me downtown to get a pair of shoes. Well, we had to stand until the whites left before we could be fitted, uh, seated, and fitted for the shoes. So otherwise, if it, was, if it was a vacant chair there, we could not sit there until it was totally empty. So uh, you can imagine what impact, negative impact, or maybe I didn't realize it or understand it at that time. But uh, as an adult, you can realize what negative impact that would have on a child. I uh, came from a broken home. Uh, uh, my mother remarried, uh, and uh, there was... Uh, difficulties in the family. I was the oldest, and uh, we just didn't see eye to eye, and I was actually asked to leave. And in doing so, uh, we didn't have all these rules and DHS and welfare at the time, so really, I think what it really occurred, uh, the, the, the school system discovered that, but I stayed in school, and eventually they got me a little part-time job and worked thereafter. Just never never looked back. I grew up on around the Deep Deuce area, but not exactly. If I recall, I it was four, Fifth Street. I grew up on. I had a I, I had a room there that I shared a room with uh, a lady by the name of Mrs. Flowers. She had uh, it was she rented rooms up the top of her two story building. And a two-story home, and I rented a room there for, I think it was seven dollars a week. What was Deep Deuce like growing up? It was booming. It uh, that was our, as I said, that was our uh, commerce area. We had, uh, of course, the newspaper there. We had restaurants. We had uh, clubs. Uh, we had both of our funeral homes were two of our funeral homes were there on Deep Deuce. We had a state employment office there on Deep Deuce, and we had a movie theater. So it was all consolidated there in one pack. You, you, you'll find this quite interesting, I think. This is a true story now. And I've been known to, to tell interesting stories. Uh, I, as a kid, two things about this. As a kid, I used to sell the Black Dispatch. which sold, It sold for 10 cents or a nickel a coffee at that time. And so one day I uh, happened to drift downtown trying to sell papers. Of course, I told you I'm all, I was on my own, and so this was a, uh, 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 this was an issue. This was a, not an issue, but this was a, a force that I would try to enhance my financial situation, let me put it that way. And so I went in the First National Bank, and uh, the guard there asked me, boy, what are you doing here? And he could tell I was a young kid with papers, newspapers in my hand. He said, well, I'll tell you what you do. You go down the stairs and go in the back, and you go back there, and those people, those are the people you want to see that back there. These were the cleaning people. And say 30 or 40 years later, maybe, I'm standing, uh, I've j had just been selected to be on the first interstate board of directors, and, and, and this was a new group. Uh, first National had uh, fallen. And uh, we were asked each board member to get up and talk about our experiences. And so when it was my time to get up, I got up and walked through the window. And I said, and I told them that story. And I said, now, here I am. 
40 years later, is one of the directors of this bank. So I thought that was only in America could you do something like that. I, I started as apprentice devil sweeping the floors and changing the job case for the numbers or the letterings to go into the newspaper. And then it would formulate into uh, cast iron and then we'd put it on a cylinder and that's the way it would, would print. I started as a as a, as a apprentice devil, and the you know, job is too too long. But anyway, to make a long story, I ended up being the manager of that newspaper, and it was owned by two doctors and Ross, the founder's nephew. Um, and saying that, um, here we go. Here we go again. I worked there a number of years. I don't. I can't recall. But the doctors and I disagreed with. They had a place for me, and uh, that rocked on for a period of time. And I woke up one day and said, "I'm not going to do this anymore with them." We differed in so many areas. We differed with the political party representative. We differed with my editorial stance, and we differed. We just differed. And to make a long story short, I, I resigned. I left. But at the time that I left, I owned 50 percent of that newspaper. And they resented that. I had worked and maneuvered and bought and patched and ended up owning 50% of it. And uh, I walked away and left it all. Didn't take a pencil with me. And within a month, month and a half, I started my own newspaper. They were then about a 30, 35 year old publication. I started mine in 18 months. They were out of business. And I've been there ever since, 37 years. So it's go, going back to the passion, the drive, the intestinal fortitude, those characteristics of an individual, uh, I'm passionate with, passionately committed to that. And uh, with that passion, I think I've been able to grow my business. I, uh, I think we have 22 radio stations in Oklahoma, all of Oklahoma, Arkansas, South Carolina, Georgia. We've been blessed. By the way, we're the largest independently owned broadcasting company in the nation, African American. From zero to that, I've, had, I've been extremely blessed. A newspaper has to have a strong personality. And it has to have confidence and credence and, and integrity. And that is where I showed you my cell phone today. There's social media, and I know it's here today. But who can you believe in? Everything's on it. But once that word is printed by a reputable publication, it means something. We're losing sight on that today. We don't have that mechanism to read those of us of a certain age. Now, the youngsters, they don't have time for it. You'll see very few people, youngsters, reading the newspaper today. There's too much out, out there, and we're losing that. And I think if we lose that ent entirely, totally, we, 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 this country will, will not be the same. The one thing that I've been involved that I've never dreamed that it would occur to me uh, is that when I was asked to serve in Governor Frank Keating's cabinet as Secretary of Commerce, over, say, right at 5,000 employees, 21 agencies uh, under my supervision, and the responsibility with uh, state and federal budget combined. Uh, of during that period of time, 21 to $30 million that I managed. Uh, and when I, when I took over Secretary of Commerce, uh, there was less than 1% people, of, a person of color. When I left, it was 23.1%. Uh, I, 
I was very, very proud of that. And not only that, I was challenged during that period of time with my confirmation, not by whites, but by four or five African-American black legislators. And I stayed six and a half years. What you see on Lincoln 8th, between 8th and 13th Street now, used to be an all-black community. I was asked by the city leaders at that time if I would serve on the Harrison Walden board. Now, uh, and the objective there was to develop that commercial strip that exists there now. And one of the challenges was that uh, replacing those residents uh, to other places where that commercial strip could be developed for the growth and development of the city, and it has occurred. Um, some people felt that it was misplacement of the residents there, and I happen to be very obje objective and positive about it. I thought it would be an enhancement for the city of Oklahoma City. And what you see now is a development of the Health Science Center that has expanded and what have you. And what also has been created is that uh, integration. Uh, when you replace those dilapidated homes for the most part, uh, there was an expansion and uh, they had federal funds to enhance the growth and development and replacement of those citizens that were re removed. That was a very difficult challenge because a lot of the community leaders did not agree with it. Uh, I happened to, happen to agree with it. A case in point, I was against busing as a publisher. I felt it would be a detriment to our community, and I think busing, busing has been good in one point, but it has destroyed northeast Oklahoma City. And now we're in the expansion plan of trying to redevelop that. I just happen to be living long enough to be involved to see the, the change. I guess I've been on the Urban Renewal Board uh, with some great leaders and great people of our city for maybe 10 or 12 years. I, I, it's been a while. Uh, look what uh, look what's happening to this city. It's been an urban renewal has been a part of that. And uh, I've always been thrilled and, and, and uh, willing to work and share my time and energy with these uh, government agencies. To be honest with you, uh, and this is very seldom said. This is my opinion again. Urban Renewal Authority was founded on, uh, it was tried, I think it was Cleveland, Ohio, just prior to us getting it here. It's been a long time, and I was a young man, but I, these are some things that I think I observed. And uh, what, it had to have federal match, a federal match to, at the beginning of Urban Renewal Authority. And uh, so it had to start somewhere. So Urban Renewal Authority started Northeast Oklahoma City. And they used public accommodations to make the federal match, meaning schools and buildings. Saying all of that, the plan was to clear up the, the, the debris, the dilapidation, and redevelop the community. And it was never done. So, it almost in certain sex, segments, sections of our city, northeast quarter of the city, almost destroyed it. And some people would say it was destroyed. And the catch was that you find you did they were not able to find developers that was willing to come over in the urban rural area, northeast quadrant area, to develop it, redevelop it. Uh, I saw that as a youngster, didn't really understand it at the time. And then you go to Northeast 23rd, which was not, it was not in the urban renewal uh, area at the time. It was, you had the white flight from a commercial standpoint. The drug stores, the retail stores, the hardware stores, everybody left. And then it turned into absentee landlords. You know what happens there. Then African Americans moved in and they didn't have the wherewithal to sustain those buildings. And the absentee landlords, didn't, weren't willing to re reinvest in it, so it died. And it's just now beginning to, and that's been 40 years, so you see how the cycle is. It can be very damaging. Now, 
saying all of that, it sounds like the Urban Renewal Authority has been a bad apple. To some extent, it, it was not planned well, uh, but it has changed. It went through a period of time while I was there. There was very little activity in this city, and downtown was feeling the impact of it. Now, in my opinion, it's been rejuvenized, and urban renewal has pay, it's been playing a very major role in re helping redevelop this all parts of this city, and it's specifically downtown. And there's a major move on now to re by investors to redevelop Northeast Quadrant of Oklahoma City. We don't have enough rooftops there, but I think that's coming too. The land, availability of land for residential areas is very limited there now, unless you remove some of those old, old homes, and that's happening too. I'm a true capitalist, all I would like to be. And one of the things that I'm often asked is, what's missing in the black community is wealth. Think what one can do with wealth if it's done properly. You can create jobs. You can support other entities. We lack that. And once we get it, we have a tendency not to share it. And I'd like to see more of that happen. Every board that I've served on in this city and state and federal, I've been asked to serve on it. Uh, I've been... Uh, I served on uh, most all of the larger banks in the Oklahoma uh, City, uh, t just to name a few. Uh, First Interstate, Boatman's Nations, Local, First Security. I've, I've served on all, I served federally on the Federal Reserve Advisory Council Board. And uh, so, no, to answer your question, I've been, been asked to, been selected to serve on. So, and I say that because, uh, you're looking at an African-American who's a Republican, who's conservative. And that doesn't go very well. It hasn't gone very well in the black community. And then some would say, well, that's the reason why you they pick you to come over here and do this and do that. And I have a different opinion of that. I, I have a right that uh, I think that we, uh, as a people in this country, we, as, and a person of color, we have seek freedom. And that means to me that true freedom is that I could be who I want to be within the confines of the law, whether it's a Muslim or Republican or Christian or whatever, give me that right. Uh, and uh, so there have been some challenges there. Uh, saying that, I, I, you know, for, for the first, I don't know if you all know this, uh, at one time, uh, Black ministers picketed me for six months in in the nineties, based on my position. That I took. They preached against me in the pulpit. They went to my advertisers and asked them not to do business with me anymore. And I was blessed to survive that and continue, and that has changed, and that's the reason why things have changed. That, have ch that has changed. I didn't lose my uh, companies. I'm still in the same location, and I'm very, very, and the people that I hire have a tremendous uh, group of young people that believe in what we, what we are all about. I thought about it and thought about it, and uh, sit down and talk with my wife and family and we all thought it was best that I had not run and that uh, I could serve my community and, and uh, my part better being a position that I was in. Yes, but I thought about it and uh, to be honest with you, I had uh, uh, I've had some comments that I should run, you know, in, in for a statewide office, but uh, I just chose not to do that. I would love to have been a part of the Thunder. <laughs> I would love to have been a owner, a part owner of the Thunder. But then it'll let me in, and I'm going to get Clay Bennett and Bob Howard, and I'm going to get them all. <laughs> so uh, that's one thing that I, I, but I'm really appreciative and thankful, and I think the Thunder has made such a tremendous impact on this city and state that uh, it'll take hundreds and hundreds, hundreds of years to to offset that.
because I have two daughters and a son. I kind of let my wife manage that, those daughters. But when my son was born, I told my wife, he's mine. And then when he, when he became of age, I looked at him and I said, young man, you're a young African-American man. You cannot afford to make one mistake. If you do, you're doomed. He's 44 years old today. And he hasn't made one serious mistake that would cost him his career. And what I was referring to, one negative charge, DUI, felony, or whatever, as a young African American coming into corporate America, you're dead if you have. And you're very lucky and fortunate if, if you had that experience and you get past it. And I believe that. People ask me when I'm going to retire, and I've been extremely blessed with my health and strength, and uh, as long as I can perform and produce, I think now that I'm in a position now that I, uh, I realize you can only drive one car at a time. You can only live in one house at a time. You could only put on one pair of pants, or you should one at a time. One thing's one at a time. So one of the blessing and rewarding things that I think that I have accomplished is that I'm I'm not I don't have greed. I mean, why do I continue to grow this company? Look at the jobs I continue to create. Look at the tax base that I continue to create. Uh, who says it can't be done because of your color? It can be done, even with those challenges. Uh, it can be done. Uh, and, and, and one of the rewarding things of why I'm here today, this city and state has been good to me. The people in this city and state has been good to me. Do Are there some bad apples? Yes. But there are much more be, be, good apples. And I'm a, I'm a good example of that. Somebody helps me. Somebody saw something in me. And I want to say thank you.